next Friday. So this stories and poems for children of all ages. Uh, Donald, um, I realize you are only eight years old and have just developed stubble prematurely. Uh, but uh, that's uh, so welcome, Louis. Welcome, Jasname. Welcome, Baba C. Welcome, Donald. And uh, welcome, Simona. Uh, tonight it's me. Uh, and I'm going to start with a story I've never told before in my life, or not in any public forum. I tried it out with a couple of people earlier today. And it's a Thai story. And it's one I kind of like, because uh, we've all had headaches. And it's from way back in time, when all the animals could talk to each other and chickens still had teeth. And the elephants were happily crumbling through the forest. You could hear the cracking of twigs. I mean, uh, there's a... Uh, yeah, you know, and they sort of well, they didn't have trunks in those days to leap up and get the uh, get the high high leaves. So they were chomping their way through when they heard a crackling, and it was a fire. And they were terrified. They knew there was fire somewhere in the forest, but they had no idea of the direction and where, and had no idea of the direction to go to reach safety. When flying above them was a swarm of bees. They said, excuse me, bees. Could you, up, you're up high, you can see what's going on. Could you tell us a, a safe direction to go? And the bees looked to the east. And the forest was consumed by fire. And they looked to the west, and the forest was consumed by fire. And they looked to the north and the forest of flames. They looked to the south and there was a river. So they said, go south, go south. Well, we'll, 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 we'll guide you. And so the bees flew up ahead and the elephants crashed through the forest. They came to the river and they leapt in the river and they just kept their noses. Like I say, they had quite short noses. Well, they weren't the trunk size. They were sort of my size, quite, quite large, but not as big as a trunk. And uh, they were breathing away under the forest when, oh, thank you bees. But of course, as the flames got nearer, the smoke got thicker. And as everyone knows, bees don't like smoke. That's how Beekeepers get them out of their hives so they can collect the honey. And they said, the elephants, elephants, uh, open your mouths so we can fly inside and you can save us from the smoke. And the bees thought, well, you saved us, we'll save you. And they opened their mouths and the bees flew inside. Now, you can imagine the noise the bees made inside those elephants' mouths. And the elephants were thinking, well, it'll only be for a short time till the, the fire passes over and, and, and they did save us and so they could stand this. It would be like having a headache for a short time. It was buzzing and it's all echoing around the mouths. Eventually, the fire got to the river and leapt over the river and carried on its way. Everything was fine. The air was clear. And the elephants opened their mouths and said, you could leave now. And the bees said, well, actually, to tell you the truth, we kind of like it. Yeah. We're, uh, it's dark, it's damp, it, we, we'd like to make our honey here. And the elephants said, yeah, and it's driving them crazy. There's noise of buzzing inside their heads. It's just, you know, like, it's like having a, a road drill outside your house that just goes on for 24 hours a day. And the elephant started uh, 
They sucked up some water and they started blowing it out their noses, hoping that the bees would leave through their noses. And they did this time and time again. Still their mouths were full of bees, but unfortunately their noses were getting longer and longer and longer. They thought, well, we can't have this, you know, it's not working. And we've ended up the, with these huge long noses. And then they thought, well, bees don't like smoke. If we light a little fire, and we breathe in the smoke through our mouths, you know, we'll choke a bit, but the bees will leave. And uh, so they got a little fire going. And they used damp wood to make sure that there was a lot of smoke and not much flame. When there was a lot of smoke going, they all breathed. <gasps> and the bees left. And ever since then, if you look at elephants, they've still got those same long noses. Now, if you look at where bees choose to live in the wild, they choose the hollow of trees because it reminds them of that damp, dark inside of the elephant's mouths. And if you should happen to see an elephant sucking up water from a pond and blowing it out of its trunk, just tell them it's okay. The bees left a long while ago. And uh, hi, Mike. Well, I did promise you. Uh, I did promise you a poem. This is, uh, I've done this before, and uh, but Mike likes this poem. And it's uh, kind of like. Uh, <laughs> So, so we'll do Monster Hunter. That is the correct one, isn't it, Mike? Absolutely. Well, it's uh, this is another perfectly true story. I was uh, I was told that no, it, it's true. It's true because me and my friend Joey thought just for a change that we'd go monster hunting on the monstrous mountain range. Right? Joey said we'll need supplies, that is what I think. So we packed some peanut butter sandwiches. Okay, Donald, just for you, we'll make it peanut butter and crisp sandwiches. Uh what flavour? Prawn cocktail? Was that prawn pra peanut butter and prawn cocktail? What are you eating, Bubba C? Smoked almonds. So we might, we'll have some peanut butter, prawn cocktail crisps, and smoke almond sandwiches. And I see Mike has a blue ribboned chocolate wafer. So we'll pack some peanut butter, prawn cocktail crisps, smoked almonds, and... Uh, a blue ribboned chocolate wafer sandwiches. Uh, Louis, what do you what do you want to eat? Uh, do you like ice cream, Louis? Do you want ice cream? Louis oh. on a bus ride. Oh, is he? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll make, we'll, we'll, we'll embarrass Louis by having him speak on the bus. We'll, uh, we'll put some ice cream in there for Louis. Uh, uh, so we'll, 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 so we pack some peanut butter, uh, prawn cocktail crisp, uh, uh, smoked almonds, blue ribbon chocolate wafer, and uh, an ice cream sandwiches. Simona, what would you like? Some uh, Nutella. Nutella, Nutella. Okay. 
So we packed some peanut butter. No, no, that's chocolate spread and pe and, and nuts. That's uh, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, so we packed some peanut butter, prawn cocktail crisps, smoked almonds, blue ribbon, uh, blue ribbon chocolate wafers, ice cream, and Nutella sandwiches. Jasname, what would you like in your sandwich? Marshmallows. Marshmallows. So we pack some peanut butter, prawn cocktail crisps, <laughs> smoked almonds, blue ribbon chocolate wafers, Nutella, ice cream, and marshmallow sandwiches. And Ali, what would you now we know you can't be eating for another few hours, but what would you like in your sandwich? That's okay. As, uh, we'll just we'll we'll just uh, have some. We'll just we'll just have um we'll just save uh, Ali some mint tea, and uh, and cans of fizzy drink. Well, Joey had a BMX night, a mountain bike. We went as far as we could on those, and then we hacked hike. We had not gone far up the mountain when Joey called, look over there. It's the barbless, razorless monster, the one that's all covered in hair. We went a few steps closer. The monster let out a roar. Okay, can, can we just have a big roar from everybody? One, two, three. Roar! Okay, I'd normally do that three times, but I think Bubba C is just... Might need to put box elf in one. Right. We're not sort of mon the monster let out a roar. You can't scare us, said Joey. That stuff doesn't work anymore. Then the enormous hairy monster with the enormous hairy head called us over to a rock. And this is what she said. If you come monster hunting, then I'll put up a fight. I'll gnash my teeth and throw some stones and roar with all my might. But I suspect that's not your wish. It only wants to know if monsters really do exist and how tall do they grow. And are there many different sorts and where do they all live with us answers to your questions that I'm prepared to give, providing that you promise me you come with good intentions. After all, we've been around for quite some time without your intervention. That means poking your nose in. No problem, answers Joey. That is understood. Now, why don't you tell all your friends we're really very good and we don't want to upset them or ruin their routine. They haven't come all this way for a monstrous display. You're the only one we've seen. Now, the barbless, raiseless monster, put a finger each side of its teeth, and then an ear-piercing whistle made the ground tremble beneath me and my friend Joey so much as she even, even she looked perturbed and frightened. Then from each side of the mountain came the loudest noise we'd ever, we'd ever heard, and it came with a rumble and tumble, and it came with a squelch and a crunch, and it came with a huffing and puffing, and it came with a gobble and munch, and some of them had six heads. And some of them only had two, and some of them were purple, and some were pink and blue, and some had hair on the palm of their hands, and one had hair on its nose, and one was as bald as though it was born, and one of them seemed to glow. And when they came up to the rock of the hairiest of them all, they were more than a little curious to why on earth she call so many of the mountains monsters in the middle of working down what could be the kind of game she'd invite them all to play. I won't keep you long, she whispered. But I have a sight that's really worth seeing. You might not have seen them around these parts before, but this is a human being. And, and there is another. that are not fully grown. I think they're wondrously strange and by far the most curious creatures to be found on this mountain range. Then Joey pulled out our sandwiches and offered them around. And without any fuss, the monsters and us sat down upon the ground. We had to agree as we munched at our lunch, although mountains have their attractions. We'd best cycle home leaving monsters alone, trying to work out our human reaction. Ah, right now, I, I'm going to do this one. I think um, this is for anyone who's worked with very young children. Simona, have you worked with very, very young children? And you know when you and, and and any of the artists and any of the storytellers here, and just now, mate, you will remember this. Maybe not. It was a long time ago, when you were only four or five years old. But when teachers ask, when or a poet is sitting there in the classroom, ask, 
are there any questions? And especially nursery school children will not ask you a question. I go, did you know? And uh, so this is a, uh, this is called, Did You Know? Did you know my best friend has been all the way to Mars? Did you know my sister broke my mum's favourite fast? Did you know my cousin is over four metres tall? Did you know my puppy dog juggles with a ball? Did you know that last night I had ice cream for your tea? Did you know... My kitten likes to play with you, me. Did you know that Saturday we all went to the zoo? Did you know that everything I say is absolutely true? That's for anyone who's worked with young children. <laughs> ah, right. And I suppose I'd better, uh, I'd better do a story. And it, this story was um, told, was sent action a letter to the Reverend Guru, who wrote in Gypsy Tanks and Tents. He was, um, he was a, a vicar from Suffolk, a place where I spent most of my life. And uh, he, he traveled around, he wrote, he, he, he wrote, he worked for a trouble with gypsies and, and spent a lot of time. And he made great friends with a guy called John Roberts, who was a Welsh gypsy. Um, he was Queen Victoria's harpist. He played harp for Queen Victoria. And he was a fiddle player as well. And uh, he's possibly, I um, may be related in some way, but that's a kind of vanity. I've got to dig that out. But my great-grandfather was a, uh, a, a, a Welsh gypsy called Robert. So. Possibly, possibly. And, uh, but he was, um, and he wrote, he, he wrote down, he wrote this down the story. Um, he was a great storyteller, harp player. He wrote down the story and sent to Reverend Groom. And um, the, and someone whose name I have actually forgotten. And, uh, but she 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 put it in uh, at the end of the nineteenth century in a book of um, gypsy folk tales. And I've been trying to tell this for years, and I, I rarely remember the whole thing. So, uh, and I probably won't remember the whole thing now. But I'm going to give it a try. And it's about a boy called Jack, because we all like Jack tales. And uh, Jack um, Jack lived with his mum and dad in the middle of the forest. And his dad was out working in the forest. And he turned around to his mum and said, look, he said, I'm never going to meet anyone in this forest. You know, and all I'm going to see is trees. Now, when you get older, you know, it becomes an idyllic sort of life. And we'd all love a, a place in the country. But, you know, when, when you're young, it's kind of boring. You know, <laughs> you want to be out partying and things. It's really difficult to park in the middle of the forest. And uh, he said, all I'll see is trees, and it'll drive me crazy. Look, I've got to go. I've got to go and make my way in the world. My mum turned to him and said, look, you can take this small cake, and I'll wish you luck. Or you can take the large cake, and uh, actually I'll stand on the roof, and I'll curse you all the way down the road. He said, oh. he says, <laughs> he said I'll tell you what, mum. He said, I love you dearly, but I'm going to get hungry on this journey. I'm going to take the large cake. <laughs> and he, he set off down the road and mum stood on the road, road shouting at him wishing him all manner of evil and disasters upon him and, uh, of course she didn't mean it but you know like she said that's what she was going to do so she had to do it he passed his dad who was working in the forest he explained to his dad what, uh, what, what he was doing and his dad said well wish you luck and he gets a little further down the road and dad calls him back and says quick I've I got, I got this little um I've got something for you. Uh, and he gave them a little snuff box. He said, don't open this unless you're really near death. And I tell you, with, with this COVID, I don't feel really near death, but I don't feel quite myself lately. And so, yeah. Anyways, 
he, he thanks him kindly and you know soon is a young man you know how long do you think that cake lasted him <laughs> yeah so he's pretty soon he's halfway through the day you know the, the cake's gone he's getting hungry again and uh, he sees a light ahead he goes around the back door and knocks on a big house huge match and he knocks on the back door and it's the maid lets him in now jack's a good looking boy and uh the maid sits him down by himself. you know my mistress is going to be very upset if i don't tell so uh, i've got jack in the kitchen here she goes uh she goes through to her mistress and says, so you the, the uh the master's uh, daughter and says uh you know like um uh, tell you what it's good like prettiest boy you've ever seen sitting in the kitchen do come in well as soon as jack and the master's daughter laid eyes upon each other of course they fell deeply in and the master came in oh, i know <laughs> the master came in he saw how the two how the two young people were looking at each other and saw I'm in a bit of trouble here. You know, he had all that daddy stuff going on. And, uh, so uh, there. So he turns to Jack. He said, uh, what can you do? And Jack said, well, I can pretty much turn my hand to anything, meaning, you know, any odd jobs, mending a fence, you know, doing, you know, all the little things. Just, you, you know, there's the sort of things you do to impress a father. Just, well, in, in that case, the master said, he said, tomorrow morning, I'd like on my front lawn, I'd like a lake and I'd like, um, I'd like a fleet of man of wars, big, big galleons. And at eight o'clock, I'd like them um, to, uh, to fire their cannons in a salute. And I'd like one of the cannonballs to go through my daughter's bedroom window and knock out the right leg of the head of her bed well and he says he says to jack he says look he said if you don't do it you know this is um you know how many stories have you listened to in your life jack you know what's going to happen if you can't do this i'm going to kill you uh, <laughs> So Jack's um, Jack Jack's a bit tired, so you know, and he's a young man. It's not much worries him, so he, he has a bit of a sleep. But he wakes up quite early, and he thinks I'm in a better bother here, and <laughs> better do something. He suddenly remembers the snuff. You know, it's about ten to eight by this time, and he remembers the snuff box, and he opens the snuff box. Out jump half a dozen little men in red caps red little nightcaps and they said uh, can we do something for you and jack says well you know my dad said uh, i am to use this if i'm really near death and i've never been near a death and i am now um yeah, yeah as it happens you can you know could you put a lake in front of them at this house and uh, put a fleet of galleons on it and eight o'clock you know it's about you haven't got much time it's like six minutes time now uh could you just um fire a cannon fire 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 a salute on the cannons and, and could he have one of the cannonballs come through the master's daughter's window and uh, knock out the right leg of the head of her bed not a problem said the little man would you believe it eight o'clock on the dock there's the lake he looks out the window there's the lake there's the galleons on it there's the cannons firing <coughs> through the window knocked out the right leg of her bed Head of a bed. Master, you're a clever fellow. He said, uh, He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you another task, see if you can do that. Could you, uh, you see all that forest out there? You know, this is, this is before the days when people tried to preserve forests. Well, actually, they're not trying to preserve forests now. In theory, they're trying to preserve forests. In fact, the forests are being cut down faster than ever before in history. But 
there is, you know, and this is before they even knew it was a bad thing. He said, he said, I, I'm, I'm fed up with, you know, it's forest block in my view. Could you take down all the trees as far as my eye can see? And if you can't, you know what's going to happen. <whistles> Off with your head. Got till tomorrow morning. Whoa. About five to eight in the morning, I opened his little box, he said, uh, uh, five minutes should be enough. Could you, could you take down all the trees as far as the eye can see? And of course, they managed it. You are a clever fellow, said the king, said the master. There are kings in the story, but we come to them later. Um, and, uh, so it's a time for your third task. I tell you what, if you do that, I'm not even going to bother to give you any more. He said, on the other side of the lake, I'd like a palace built on seven golden pillars. You know, and after after your marriage, you can live there with my daughter. Not a problem, said Jack. And would you believe it? By eight o'clock in the morning, there was the palace built. It was on seven golden pillars. Well, you'd think that was the end of his problems, wouldn't you? But you know, this was a story told around campfires, and it was never going to be over in five minutes. So there's a. So the master and his friends are out hunting, and he's told his friends all about this uh, this golden palace, this uh, palace on on uh, on the golden on the golden pillars, and he's taken Jack out riding with him, but Jack has left the snuff box in his waistcoat pocket, hanging in his room. And the servant, one of the servants is cleaning the room and she feels something. He pulls out the snuff box and of course he, he just thought, well, you know, I need to, I need to know, uh, you know, you, you don't just pull out a snuff box like that and not open it. Well, you know, even, even if you didn't mean any ill, you'd do it, wouldn't you? You'd just sort of just be curious. Open the snuff box and out jumped the little man with the red hands on. Can we do something for you? He said, whoa, 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 whoa. yes, you can. Could you, uh, could you move that palace, that golden palace on the seven, uh, on the seven, um, on the seven golden um, pillars? Could you, could you move it to the other side of the sea and me with it? Well, when the master got back and Jack with him, the palace was nowhere to be seen. And the master turned around to Jack and said, you're, you're playing tricks on me. You're playing tricks. You've made me look like a fool now in front of all your friends. You've got a year and a day to get the palace back. Or if not, I'm going to hunt you down. And you know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Off with your head. Whoa. Well, off goes Jack. He take, he's, he's got a half decent horse by this time. He rides off and he goes down the highways and byways. Can't find the palace anywhere. And he, he came to the palace. And I told you there was going to be a king or two in this story of the king of the mice. And there's a little mouse sentry sitting on the. Uh, sitting guard in the gateway and he asked Jack his business and Jack said, I've come to see the king of the mice. And the king of the mice took Jack in and uh, Jack told him his tale. And he said, I'll help you. I'll help you. He said, you rest. You rest till the morning. Then I'll call all, all the mice in the world. And I'll ask them if any of them have seen the golden power. Next morning, he said, Jack, well, 
you know, you can be sure if there's any story with Jackie, he's going to eat well through the whole story. And so he's eating really well. He has a great night's sleep. He's sure this is going to work. So next morning, the king of the mice calls for the mice. In. But none of them knew where the palace was. None of them had seen. The king of mice said, "Take you, but change. I'll, I'll lend you a new horse because, uh, you know, those Baba C knows this. Those people who, you know, the the the, the, the in, in countries where you re ride for a long time, you swap your horses at the, the, in the next day because, you know, they're they're tired out the end of the day. You probably worn them down. So he's given a fresh horse, and he's given a cake. He says, uh, he said, my, you know." He said, don't eat this. I know what you like, you boys, but don't eat it. Take this to my brother, who happens to be the king of the frogs. He might know. Well, everyone went, but as he, as he was leaving, the little mouse sentry said, can I, can I come with you? He said, look, I'm not sure the king will be too bleak. No, no, I'll be really useful. It's all right, climb up. And he climbed up the horse's leg and leapt in there. The waistcoat, Jack's waistcoat pocket, or vest pocket, if you happen to be transatlantic. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, and by that, Louis, I don't mean something, you know, that, that is like a tank top with no. Yeah, but that's, uh, uh, so, uh, and off they go, and they come to the King of the Frogs. And, same thing happens there. The poor, poor, the he rests well. He gives a cake to the king of the frogs. They eat well. Next day, all the frogs are called. None of them know who it was. But as he's leaving, he's given a cake. He said, My brother is the king of the birds. Go and see him. He might know. Then he's leaving. The frog, little frog sentry says, Can I, can I come with you? And of course, he leaps in the other waistcoat or vest pocket. And uh, they, uh, and they come to the king of the birds, and the king of the birds, uh, he dresses up obviously. And next day, he calls all the birds. None of the birds know. Him. He's just about to give up when the biggest bird you've ever seen, the eagle, flies in. He says, "Do you happen to have? Yeah, I like that. I like that flying, Bubba C. That's really good." So I normally do it with my arms outstretched, but it's kind of difficult on Zoom. And uh, the <laughs> so he says, "Do you happen to have seen a, a golden palace?" He said, "Yeah." He said, uh, "He said that's why I'm late. I, I just saw this thing. I hung around for a while. I'm like, hey, it's a long way off." He said, "Well, can you take Jack?" Said the King of the Birds. I said, "Yeah, but I need some food first. So they killed a thief." So they had, uh, so the eagle had something to feast on. I know, but it's how it was told around the fire. I'm not responsible for that. Uh, so, they, so he had the best parts. But they all the eagle at the best. No, I mean Jack wasn't a cannibal. Um, the, 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 it was the eagle that had the best parts of the sea. And off they flew, and they get to the palace, and they wonder how they can get out the stuff. The mice says, I tell you what, we'll wait till everyone's gone. I'll crawl under the uh, crawl under the door. And uh, maybe I'll see. And maybe maybe I can get the snuff box. And if I can't, maybe I can get the key. So and <clears throat> he finds the snuff box, but it's just too big to get out the underneath the door. So he climbs up the door and he knocks down the key and pushes that out. And Jack lets himself out. They take the cult the snuff box are flying off across the back across the ocean and they're all like well you know the eagle and the mouse are arguing about who was really responsible for getting this box back you know they they did you know the way people argue i did the job i did the job no i'm most important when inevitably they drop the box into the ocean and the frog thinks, now's my moment, and leaps out, and he stays under that water for three days, and he pops up. Have you got the box now? 
And he goes down again, he stays underneath for another three days. And he pops up. And uh, he stays under what, this time he comes up with the snuff box. They, they stop arguing this time. They hold on to it really tight. And they go back to the king of the birds. And, uh, and then Jack opens the... Uh, uh, the, 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 um, he's got uh, he opens the snuff box and um, he says can, can you break, can you get the palace back here I'll come with you and they go back and they wait until everyone's out apart from the cooks and the old gypsy woman that would, she had to be knocking at the back door she'd wait till everyone gone as well she was just hoping that some of the servants would give her you know would, would give us some food for having their fortunes told. And Jake said, uh, do you want to stay here or do you want to come with me? And they all decided to go with uh, Jack. And I mean, it took days to get flight. You know, they, you can't just fly a palace across the ocean quickly. And they were still, they were still there on a Sunday. So there's a little chapel in the, in, in the palace. So they, they, all, all the servants, gypsy women were singing hymns and, uh, Actually, the organ sounded really bad, but uh, but then they realised that one little man was stuck in one of the uh, one of the organ pipes and they pulled him out. And, uh, then, then it sounded really good. <laughs> they got to the uh, they get get to the king of the birds, and actually the king of the birds quite he, he falls in love with the gypsy woman straight straight away. But uh, and so Jack Jack said, "I'm going to leave my palace here." And uh, says the gypsy woman, "Will you will you stay stay here or stay with the palace?" She says, oh, "I think I'll stay with the palace for a minute. Just just hang about here with the king of the birds." So the king of birds lends uh, Jack a horse, and he swaps it three times on the way home. And he gets there. He's only got a few days to go, and, uh, but uh, he. Uh, He's got still got the snuff box in his pocket, obviously. And, and he, his wife is kind of really upset because he hadn't brought the palace home. She and she really liked him. She didn't want him to get his head cut off. And she kind of liked her palace as well. Uh, but he said it's okay. And he, he, he goes back and he gets out the snuff box. He said, "Quick, uh, take me, take me back to the palace. Take him back to the palace." And he turns around and. Uh, he says, I've got to take the palace now, he said, uh, said the king of the birds. And he said, uh, he said, the gypsy woman, do you want to, do you want to stay here with the king? He said, I'd like to stay here. And Jack said, well, you know, I kind of wanted you as a nurse. And uh, so I flew back, king of the birds, my bit upset, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure I quite agree with Jack about this because, you know, the king of the birds had done them a solid but there's a, you know, but, you know, ooh, ooh. anyway, they get back and, uh, oh, mass celebration. And, uh, Jack's kind of feeling bad, you know, gypsy woman looks heartbroken, you know, she could have been married to a king. So, yeah, and she's kind of by herself. And, uh, you know, he'd already asked her who her people were. She said, oh, the Lovells, the Smiths, the Lees, the Stanleys. All the big gypsy families. And uh, so Jack opened his little snuff box. And he said, could you go and get a decent sized galleon and go and gather the gypsy woman's families? And they did that. And all the gypsies lived be on a brilliant encampment. You know, it was the finest sight. You know, they, they, I've seen some great sights, but this was the greatest sight ever. It's down by the lake. And for generations, the children from the big palace and the gypsy children played together. And for generations, the gypsies nursed those children. And I tell you what, if you, you couldn't have told who was who eventually. I know this. Because last time I was there, I sat round the fire. And someone with a really long memory told me all about it. Whoa. I'm going to finish on a poem.
Hey, do you like that, Louis? Oh, do. Okay, we're going to have a story, not a story, we're going to have stories, we're going to have a poem about, uh, about babies. I'm really sentimental about babies. I mean, what else could get a fully grown adult? to put its head in a box, going coochie, coochie, coo. But the weirdest thing is that adults, as soon as they're born, adults want them to speak. Say mama, say dada, say mama, say dada. Eventually they go, dada! There's notices down the post office, it says dada. They're ringing up Aunt Mabel in Australia. Then it has to walk. They hold it up by its hands. Every adult knows that it's really bad for babies to hold them up by their hands. It pulls their, their arms out of their sockets, but no one takes. Can you take it? All right, I'll take a step. Just, just, just let go of my hands. It's hurting. Takes three steps. There's great joy there. They're sending letters off. They're sending cards. They're putting it on the internet. They're putting it on Facebook. They've got photos of it and everything. For the rest of its life, the poor little thing is told to sit down and shut up. So, <laughs> anyway, so this is my, I'm going to finish with this. It's, um, it's, uh, it's an ode to babies. I'll put on my Betjeman boys. It may look sweet in blues and pink. But that baby in the playpen stinks. And changing several times a day does not make that smell go away. The more it pongs, the more it smiles. Babies can be really vile. They stick their fingers in their food, and even when they're being, being rude, those grown-ups never seem to mind. But what gets me is what's left behind. It seems to come from either end, and all the wild adults pretend that this machine that makes the pongs so perfect, it can do no wrong. And with that, who have we got next Friday? We've got Norman next Friday, Norman Perrin next Friday. Oh, you got the... the, uh, the no, yes. <laughs> nah. got, copy. <laughs> and you've got a signed copy of it right it's one of my favorite poems john thank you very much well i've got, got to do, I couldn't write something once in my life but someone's favorite uh, you uh, just encouraged me to write a brand new story <laughs> and i'm going uh, to wind up telling it not today but it's your fault <laughs> thank you okay well, thank you for listening. Thank you, Louis, for being here. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, Donald Babasi and Jasname, who will be with us on Tuesday at five o'clock. The time, despite what it says, Ali will change the time, the time till five o'clock. And also, I'm going to invite slightly old Simona. This might be relevant to you. Um, slightly older students. I'm going to make it under 25 um, for the young tellers. So. Uh, yeah, that doesn't include you, Baba. Um, yeah, just missed it, Baba. See, you just met you, you're, you, you're 26, <laughs> okay? So, uh, 25 but, and a half. But if you've got any students that would like to come on, that's five o'clock UK time. Um, and uh, then we've got nothing this weekend, so the next program is the Young Tellers on Tuesday at five o'clock, then on Wednesday at Actually, this is very so sociable time for Bubba C in uh, in the USA at 10:45 UK time. Uh, we have um, we have our, uh, our Moroccan tellers at the cafe on Wednesdays at 10:45 because uh, because of Ramadan that means uh, they've eaten. There's been evening prayers and they and people are, you know can can relax a little bit. So, and then, of course, next Friday, we have Norman Perry doing children's stories. But meanwhile, thank you very much for listening. I shall, uh, 
I shall pretend that um, I'm not ill and uh, just go back and clap. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Louis. Have a great bye. week. Bye, bye. Everyone, have a fantastic weekend. Bye, Louis. No yeah. swim today? Bye, bye. Yeah. Uh, I said no swim today. And John, you did inspire me to write a story. And I am blaming on you because it has a pun involved. Okay. <laughs> right, Ali, thank you very much for flying the magic carpet. See out.